so the whole idea of this round table again was similar to the one before that it's very good for us I think to get a feel of what is it that we as a group together want to tackle, what is it, the discussions that we should be having. But we also wanted to use this afternoon to get external perspectives in order to also make sure that we don't miss things, to help us also interpret of what we see. And I'm very happy to introduce to you our three panelists for on table two, a very mixed, uh, mixed uh, sum of people. So on the very left we have Menno Bart, who is from Eurocid, and Eurocid is the Con European Confederation of Private Employment Services. Employment Services. Thank you very much. And in the end, what he's working on is to talk a lot about employability and telling audiences like us in the end of what kinds of skills and knowledge young graduates should have. So I think it will be a very interesting perspective especially when we come back to this discussion of employability. What actually should our students, after finishing our courses, be able to tackle in the end? Next to Menno, we have Vit, uh, Vito Borelli from the European Commission in DG Education and Culture. And Vito Borelli is now the Chaumonet section chair in the European Commission. So, um, of course, a very important uh, unit for all of us, um, Nino and also, Ludmilla were mentioning a couple of times, well, we need money. The European <laughs> Commission is normally actually quite good in also facilitating this project, so I'm really happy that you're here with us. And I think it will be very interesting also to get, you, get your perspective of what do the institutions want us in the end? What, what is the European perspective from the European institution perspective? <laughs> <laughs> in terms of what we should in the end achieve in this cooperation. And last but not least, I'm very happy to introduce to you a former student from Maastricht, uh, Nino, who is now at, uh, at SEPS, the Center for European Policy Studies. Uh, and I'm very happy that Nino agreed to join us because she has both perspectives. So she studied in Georgia, not at Tbilisi State, unf unf unfortunately. Unfortunately. <laughs> but at the same time, she also studied in Maastricht. So I thought she would be a very nice addition to bring us also this, this student perspective of what it actually is, because in the end I think a lot of the reforms that we're doing is for our students. So I think it will be uh, very interesting to have these different perspectives. I asked the panelists uh, to think about four questions. <coughs> On the one hand, what do they think of the presentations? So were they convincing? Are there things that they <coughs> thought we perhaps missed in our analysis? And then I also wanted to know their own, their own opinion in terms of what do they think is the added value for students to do a European Studies degree. So what is it, the content, the skills that students have after finishing these courses? And on the other hand, I also wanted to ask them, so what do you think is the shortcoming in terms of how you observe the current practice? What is the shortcoming that we see in European Studies? Um, each speaker has 10 to 12 minutes, and perhaps we can just go in the order and start with the employer's perspective. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me uh, uh, as well. Um, to say a little bit about myself, I'm uh, indeed working for Eurosiet uh, and private employment services, which is what we uh, uh, represent, are in fact um, things like agency work, uh, but a little bit broader than that. So it's HR professionals, uh, basically. Uh, our members are, for example, uh, Manpower, Randstad, ADECO, just to give you an example of, of where we are uh, at. Um, personally, I'm a, uh, an alumnus of European Studies as well. I uh, graduated in 2006, uh, actually with Jamal Shaheen, who was here before uh, uh, today. Um, and after that, I did a course at the Dutch, uh, or the Netherlands Institute for International Relations. Um, I worked in Dutch public administration, uh, I was a diplomat shortly, then I came to Brussels where I first worked as a consultant and now I'm a lobbyist for uh, Eurosiet. Um, as private employment services uh, in Europe, uh, each year we support about 8 million Europeans in their job life, uh, out of which are 3 million are under 25, so that means that we are an important way of gaining access to the labor market for, for many young people. Uh, we upskill, or our members upskill, uh, over one million Europeans. So that's just to give you an example of 
where we are in, in the labor market. Um, personally, I uh, will try to give you a bit of a twofold perspective. So indeed, the employer's perspective, uh, the things that we as a professional see happening on the labor market, but on the other hand, also uh, my personal perspective as a European <laughs> studies alumnus trying to find a job in Brussels first and later to uh, try and find uh, uh, employees or, or interns, uh, some of the things that we uh, that we uh, encountered there, which also means that my focus is specifically not on uh, uh, European uh, studies students uh, as scholars. I mean, that, that's a whole different branch. I, I'm definitely focusing at, at really the practical uh, labor market. In terms of what we heard, I think that's very interesting. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there this morning, so I haven't been able to to see everything that happened but um, I, I was very happy with the three two uh, uh, previous uh, presentations um, what I picked up there a, a few terms is first of all interdisciplinary um, I think that was also a, a subject uh, this morning already and I think that's very important um, in uh, Brussels specifically there's a, a I think a lot of people here are more or less generalists with a little bit of knowledge about a lot of subjects rather than uh, specialists. Of course, I mean, in, in working in European affairs here in Brussels, uh, there are a lot of different profiles, um, but this is my experience anyway. Another thing that I picked up just now is uh, uh, you said when you started, a lot of people in, in Georgia didn't even know the difference between the Council of Europe and the European Union. To be quite honest, I think that's still the case, only not in this EU bubble where we are right now. But among the general public, let's let's not kid ourselves, that's still the case, unfortunately. Um, I also wanted to touch upon the European Studies versus European Union Studies debate. For an employer uh, to have a candidate in, for, in front of him who has a master's in European Studies, he will automatically assume that this is someone who knows how the European Union works. Um, and if a candidate then has to explain to him, well, to be quite honest, I only studied uh, a lot of culture and, and history and, and uh, some social stuff, but I have actually no idea uh, what the difference is between the European Commission and the Council. I mean, there's, I mean, there's a lot of uh, scholarly or academic reasons for those kind of uh, uh, topics, but for an employer it will need some explanation. So it makes things at least a bit more complicated, I would say. Um, from my perspective, or, or from our perspective as employers, I would say that labor markets are changing nowadays. Um, one of the things that we often say is uh, we see, well, perhaps not the end, but at least a diminishing of what we call the salariat. Uh, the fact that employees are with one employer for uh, a full-time uh, uh, employment relationship, uh, open-ended contract. That still exists, of course, and it's still very important. But to be quite honest, uh, we see the, uh, the percentage of other types of employment increasing. Um, that means that candidates have no job security. They may have something called work security, going from one job to another, but there is no such thing as job security. Um, you see a lot of people now, nowadays engaging in, in multi-activities. Uh, the, uh, uh, the new generation coming onto the labor market right now, the, the Generation Y, is also sometimes called the slasher generation. That doesn't have anything to do with access and a lot of uh, you know, bloody uh, uh, things, but it's people are often lobbyists slash novel writer, slash uh, uh, cupcake baker. And this is not a temporary thing. They just like to do all these uh, things. And why shouldn't they? Um, that also has an implication on how, how people uh, should be prepared to, uh, for the labor market. Um, if you raise people to become a specialist, it will be harder for them to be active in such a multi-activity world. Um, 
that is even exacerbated by the fact that uh, knowledge is becoming obsolete more and more quickly. Um, in European Union studies, uh, of course, that, that may be a bit less. I mean, we all, after Lisbon, it, the situation was the same and, and it won't change that quickly, all the institutionalia. On the other hand, I mean, even now we, we are still witnessing, you know, a lot of new and exciting stuff uh, at the political front and, and you never know what's going to happen next. So um, I've hear, heard people uh, say that usually knowledge uh, becomes obsolete after seven years. Well, I mean, that's a debatable figure, obviously, but it does show you have to, as a candidate, you have to keep investing in uh, your own employability. You have to, it's not a one-time thing. No, you have to keep, keep on moving, basically. Um, and that's even more so because employers, as I said, may, may not be your employer for life. They may be shorter term employers. So why would a short-term employer be so interested in educating you or in, in keeping your knowledge up to date? No, it's more up to the candidate itself, himself or herself to keep his knowledge up to date. Um, which is a lucky thing because, as I said, the Generation Y is uh, uh, much more focused on individual development. For the Generation Y, they are not focused on how to adapt their life to the job that may or may not come along. No, for them, the job should adapt to whatever the heck they want to do in their lives. Um, which also means that employers have to deal with flexible working situations, for example. People working from home, people working part-time, people working uh, as an independent, people working, uh, people taking uh, uh, um, a, a break for a year or, or two and coming back onto the labor market. So things are moving really quickly. Um, Therefore, what I think, and, and I'll close off with that, what is important uh, for candidates who come onto the labor market uh, is to have not only the knowledge of the field that they want to be working in, which is European affairs, <coughs> but also to be, let's say, workplace savvy, to know what it is to work. Uh, and there I can put in some of my own experience. When I came onto the labor market, I thought I knew quite a lot of international affairs because I just, you know, I did uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, and did a nice master's program, etc. And my first job was five months in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and I basically had the idea that I knew nothing. I, they just told me, oh, by the way, can you draft a position paper on this? And, Excuse me, what? How do I do this? But what is expected of me? And these kind of things are actually not something you would learn in, uh, in university. Because when I drafted my first uh, uh, piece, they said, well, okay, this, but then one-fifth of the length, and please just, uh, uh, you know, sources, yeah, sure, it's nice to have sources, but I just want your uh, argument. Uh, I want to know why we should or shouldn't do something. So. For just the style of writing is already very different, and, and there's many more uh, uh, skills like these. Uh, personal skills, uh, selling yourself in the workplace, these are all skills that uh, I think students can, uh, can really develop a lot more before, uh, before entering the labor market. And then finally, one remark on, on how we see our role. Um, because of this complex labor market, we as, as labor market intermediacy in, in, see an, in, uh, a more important role for ourselves. Uh, all these people who, who come onto the labor market and actually have sometimes not even an, an idea of what they want to do, and all these companies looking for short-term uh, employees just for doing this one project or for doing this one other thing. And I think it will be become more and more normal for people to work through an agency or through a third party anyway uh, as you know, uh, uh, matching supply and demand on the labor side. So, uh, and I'd be happy to, to take a lot of questions, obviously. But, uh. Okay, thank you very much, Melo. Uh, I also, again, here recognize a lot of things that we keep talking about in Maastricht, but also what we had in the round table today in the morning, this idea of skills, that perhaps it's not only to get knowledge into the heads of our students, but perhaps actually it's much more important to learn them 
to develop skills, but then also to be flexible to apply them in different situations. So I think there will be a lot of, of things that we can take away. Thank you very much. Let's move on and see the institutional perspective. Uh, the floor is yours, Vito. <coughs> thank you, Heidi. And thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, event. As uh, Heidi already mentioned, uh, I've been working on the uh, Jean Monnet program for uh, some months now. I'm relatively new in the Jean Monnet community. In fact, I used to work before for the Erasmus Mundus program. I've been working on it for 10 years. So I have some knowledge about joint master's degree, joint doctoral degrees. My experience in Jean Monnet is relatively short, and that's why it was for me a very interesting opportunity today to get in touch with the uh, people who are really implementing projects in this area. And I was uh, positively uh, impressed by the fact that these uh, project uh, uh, puts together two important actions that are supported by the European Union, which are the Jean Monnet program in terms of EU studies and the Tempus programs in terms of capacity building. So it is a very good mixture of activities that are currently now uh, covered by the framework program Erasmus Plus that has just been launched at the beginning of 2014. As you know, uh, before that, uh, um, Jean Monnet was part of the LLP, Lifelong Learning Program, whereas Tempus was a bit outside of the normal framework program, together with the other international programs like Erasmus Mundus, like Alpha, Alban, EduLink, uh, and uh, Asia Link some years ago. This uh, project is therefore a very good opportunity to put together two important aspects of uh, the EU policies and programs, which is capacity building again and European studies. I think that uh, mm, the one of the debates that was um, very live this morning and also this afternoon was this differentiation about EU studies and European studies. I think that this uh, debate is at the core of the Jean Monnet community, in fact, and I think if I may just add also my perspective on this uh, rather uh, interesting uh, debate, I, I personally think that uh, at the end of the day, EU studies or EU integration studies is, is a subgroup of European studies in the sense that Europe would exist anyway even without the EU, without the European Union. So studies on Europe would exist in any case. Georgia and Moldova and Ukraine are part of Europe, but they are not yet part of the European Union. So I think that uh, uh, what is important is that we establish a clear uh, limitation in which we make clear that what we are trying to pursue also with the Inotless uh, uh, project is the introduction of the EU concept also in its relations with non-EU countries. So I think that, for instance, the idea of introducing modules on Georgia relationship with European Union is absolutely legitimate and, uh, on the contrary, it's uh, even, in my view, desirable because it uh, tends to link the uh, history, culture, political development, uh, social development of Georgia or Ukraine or Moldova with the ones of the European Union. That being said, I think that one lesson that I may draw also from the presentations that were made this morning and this afternoon is that many of the uh, recommendations that come out from the study, sur from the surveys and from the literary reviews are very often applicable not only to the European or EU studies uh, area. I'm just thinking, for instance, to the recommendations to motivate students to explain to students the relevance of their efforts vis-a-vis -vis the topic that they are studying, uh, or the use of innovative approaches and tools, or again, the development of job-oriented skills. All these are elements that come out very clearly from the surveys and the literary, literary reviews, which may be applicable to all subject areas. So I think that it's very interesting perhaps to try and focus more in the rest of the project on the specific aspects of the EU studies that should perhaps come up more clearly from these analysis of the results of the surveys. I would also like to link the fact of this uh, um, uh, distinction between EU and European studies by highlighting to those who are not yet informed about that, that uh, the Jean Monnet program organizes every year 
an annual Jean Monnet conference where all Jean Monnet professors and also other stakeholders are invited to participate. This year, the Jean Monnet conference will take place on the 1st and 2nd of October. And uh, the theme of the conference will be the future of EU studies. So I think that the input of your project also to the discussion that may uh, be developed in the framework of the conference are very, very much relevant for the, for the implementation of the discussion. Uh, of course, I'm not in a position to invite you all to participate because this is a rather restricted conference, but there will be the possibility to follow it also in web streaming and also to participate in more interactive ways to this conference. So I would uh, strongly invite you to keep in touch with the Jean Monnet professors involved in the project, so to allow you to participate even if at a distance or in any case uh, uh, remotely to the uh, discussions in the conference. I would also like to touch upon uh, a few of the other topics that have raised, uh, have been raised during the discussion today. One of them, again, was already mentioned, was this interdisciplin interdisciplinarity of uh, uh, EU studies uh, programs. Uh, I think we all agree that uh, it is difficult to establish uh, the right balance between interdisciplinarity and multi or pluridisciplinarity. I think that this is an issue for the program coordinator to find out the right balance, the right approach. In any case, I think I would totally agree with some <coughs> comments that were made this morning that it is important to provide to all students at the very beginning of the course, whether it is an undergraduate or a master course, with the basic elements which make it possible for all to follow the specificities of the program more in detail. So to establish some core courses which allow uh, to create a balance, a, a, a common base for all students who follow the course. <coughs> On the uh, language, I think that the, 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 the topic that came out this morning on the English as vehicular language is uh, one, of course, which applies to EU studies as well as to any other study in Europe. It's clear that the use of English as a vehicular language in study programs is the result of the internationalization policy that is uh, uh, conducted by nowadays universities in almost the whole world. It's clear that if we want to attract students from other countries, we have to provide teaching in English. However, I think that this is not the main problem. English is by now the lingua franca is uh, not even considered as a foreign language. It has become a sort of a code of communication among students, among professionals, among uh, practitioners. In any case, I would draw here a lesson from another program where I have worked, which is Erasmus Mundus, where it was clearly stated that although the language of communication, of teaching, was, could be English for all courses, all institutions had to make a little effort to introduce in the study program an element of the language or the culture of the country where the course was given. So if a course is given in Maastricht, in the Netherlands, where, by the way, like in many other Nordic countries, English has become the only language almost at master's level or post postdoctoral level, there should be the possibility to introduce one module on Dutch culture, Dutch language, in a way that even students coming from other countries and who want to study a specific subject in English have the possibility to learn something about, to get familiar with the culture and the language of this nation. This was a clearly stated requirement under the Erasmus Mundus program. It continues to be so. And I think that this should be a good practice that, that could be also shared with other programs. Uh, on the skills, I think that we all agree on the necessity for programs to provide not only contents and, uh, and knowledge, but also skills. And these skills should be appropriate to the new jobs that uh, are arising. And I think that flexibility is here perhaps the key word. On the innovative pedagogical methods and tools, I would just like to make a link with uh, a communication that the European Union has uh, uh, produced only a couple of years ago, which is Open Up Education, which very much puts the accent on the importance of the new uh, informatic tools uh, which are necessary to 
spread information and to also complement uh, the uh, traditional uh, education methods. I'm referring in particular to the MOOCs, as we call them, to the um, massive open online courses, which are becoming more and more uh, widespread in Europe and in the rest of the world, but for which it is necessary to uh, establish uh, very clear rules of quality, because otherwise we risk to dilute the level of quality of the courses that we uh, can um, also provide online. So certainly it is a very good uh, uh, input, very good uh, improvement in terms of uh, uh, reaching more people and uh, also uh, adding quality and content to the courses, but we have to be careful to ensure the necessary quality to these courses. I would like just to uh, uh, finish with a very short reference to um, something that was said also this morning. I think that is the reference to the Euroscepticism. I think that uh, in these times of Euroscepticism, we have seen the results of the uh, European Parliament's elections only uh, one month ago. Uh, I think that more than ever today, it's uh, important to uh, support uh, the European studies or EU studies or both <laughs> in uh, Europe and in the rest of the world. So I think that this project comes very timely at this point in time. And I also think I tend to agree with uh, uh, someone who said this morning that Euroscepticism can also convert itself into a boomerang effect because I mean it is something that we are trying to fight but which is at the same time rising the attention and the interest of young people towards Europe just to counter these uh, phenomena these uh, uh, these uh, movements that uh, exist in different uh, European member states and uh, that courses like this one can help to uh, to counter in some way Okay, thank you very much. You. I'm not going even to try and summarize uh, this many different points. Perhaps just one remark. What I find very interesting when you were also mentioning, well, of course, a course on Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, EU relations is very important and should be part of a European Studies degree. My only thought was like, yes, and that's why I'm really looking forward to cooperating with all of you, because that's actually where we don't have expertise, for example, in Maastricht or where we could need more expertise also in getting different perspectives in. So I think there's a lot also in terms of cooperation that is going on. Last but not least, Nino, what's your perspective as just a very recent student? Does everything you heard make sense or would you disagree? Um, well, I would rather bring a, a critical uh, point to the table, but uh, it's really hard to be the last um, panelist. <laughs> Uh, and, and the tired audience, obviously. So let me first greet the Georgians in Georgian. Zalian Mikhail Romogzandista, Imedi Maxrom, Daime Sainterosos, I have to transfer Anashi. In Moldovan, I know only Chefaj, and in, in, uh, in Ukrainian, I know Diagri, so I don't even know how to put them together. Um, so I, I will go back to the common language here, uh, English. Um, well, first of all, I should start from the introduction. Uh, and it was uh, 2008, uh, right after the Russian-Georgian War, that I had to choose my major profession. And uh, I chose the European Studies. Um, I didn't actually know anything about it. I didn't even have read the curriculum. I don't know whether it existed because we didn't have the inter uh, internet system by them at the university. Uh, I didn't know the professors, uh, neither methodologists, I even doubt that the professors had thought about the methodologies. Um, but there were two things that attracted me most in, in this program, and that was the word European, and that word for me referred to the EU, not to the EU as, a, as an organization or a Europe as a territorial unit, but I think it referred to the idea. And, and the idea was opening our societies, and that was the most important thing for me by then. And the second thing that was even more attracting in, in that program for me, something new. It was a very new program launched at our university. Uh, I didn't know much about it, but I knew that was a change. And uh, that was uh, distancing myself from the post-Soviet um, practices that we had at, at the educational level. Um, so that is how I actually find, found myself being one of the laboratory rabbits uh, of, of the European <laughs> Studies program at my university. That was how we referred to ourselves uh, because it pretty much depicted the situation. 
that was a new program in the process of modification and transformation and every semester we would fill experiments and all the changes that was very confusing for us um, uh, but I would say it was not until the last year that I found myself really passionate about the discipline and that was in Istanbul summer school when I was introduced to new methods and to a new European professor and and um, and this experience, I think, opened for me a very big uh, passion that I found in my um, career uh, in future. And hereby, I'd like to say Heidi, because she was my professor by then. And I would like to uh, thanks, uh, express my thanks to her for that. Um, but also, I would like to express all of you the thanks and gratitude for especially involving the neighboring countries. And now I would go to business. <laughs> Um, I would like to uh, touch upon the issue of the so-called employability that was also mentioned here and I think the, the most popular word and that everybody would uh, remember from this conference will be interdisciplinarity after today's meetings. Um, so I will continue this tradition. Uh, but I wouldn't call it interdisciplinarity, I wouldn't go into the academic debates, but I would rather be more practical and call it a big, big confusion. And uh, that's a confusion that comes from the question, where does the European studies belong to? Uh, well, the simplest answer would be the social sciences, but then the whole complication starts. Is it a political science? When we talk about the internal market, then economics intervene. When we talk about, uh, I don't know, specific issues, CFSP, then uh, the international relations intervene, etc., etc. Uh, and that is translated in the titles of the programs. In Maastricht, we see European studies. Next door in Ghent, we see the EU studies. In the Anglo-Saxon context, we see the European politics. In America, it's a whole variety of programs. And that, I would say, is a big confusion. That's a confusion among academics, too, as I found out, but for the students and also employers. So for the employers, what I have uh, come up with, uh, ran, ran into with my experience is, is the question. So are you a person who knows things about the European Union or are you a political scientist who is interested in the EU? That's the question what the employers have. And then you have to start from the beginning explaining everything. And um, that is on the uh, European context. If I bring the... Uh, comparison with the neighboring countries, I think the labor market for us is very limited. We are excluded from the European institutions. Uh, we don't really have lobbyists, unfortunately or fortunately. Uh, consultants is hardly ever. So the direct thing what we could do is to work for the ministries of your integration. Some of the countries doesn't even have such ministries. Uh, maybe missions to the EU and the missions usually consist of three, five people, so it's really hard to get in, um, and etc., etc. And uh, this connects with 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 the survey that uh, we saw today that most of the European studies uh, graduates work in, in in the fields that are not connected to directly to their field, and I think that should be uh, that should be the. That, that is a problem. The problem is the gap between the academic uh, discipline and the job market that we have and that should be addressed by the academics and also practitioners, I think. Now, the second thing I would um, like to touch upon is, is uh, I, I, would, I think I would be rather critical here. I think the most important thing is, is methodology. And that's what I experienced myself coming from the BA degree from Georgia and then going to the European Institute with different methodologies. And PBL was hardly ever mentioned here. In fact, I have downloaded this syllabus from the, um, this is the Georgian University MA uh, in European Studies syllabus and I specifically checked whether there is anything about methodology and the only thing, only, only sentence that I had found there was that we will introduce new methods. And nobody knows the, what this method is. And this, this is a critical, uh, critical uh, uh, note, but I hope this is a constructive criticism because I think what matters uh, is to distance ourselves from the past. And the past says that the content is more important than the way we, we, we deliver the things, which is rather not, not the case in our, in our discipline, I would argue the, uh, otherwise. On the other hand, I have Maastricht University syllabus, which has a, a whole uh, paragraph and paper about PPL, about different kinds of methods, 
And I think this pretty much shows the gap what we have in our countries and what is on the European level. I must say here, P-Bill is a very important uh, method and this should be elaborated more maybe with the training. Uh, but to be quick, I must say that P-Bill is very important for one very specific reason. It's based on the, on the self-study. And, and this is not the culture of, of our region. We don't have the culture of giving more importance to education rather to grades. Everything we care is what is our grade. Please, professor, what did you give me? And you never care what, what did you get from the course. So I think people should be implemented because it's very important, but then we also have to understand that everything that is good in, on the European level cannot be adopted the right way to our region. We have our context, which is very important. And the context that I mentioned is not, no culture of self-education. And I think um, whoever will implement this method, and this has not been uh, referred specifically from the Georgian or I lacked this reference to methods, how to do it and uh, about the people, I would say that they will have a very, very hard work of, of, of adapting this to the Georgian or other uh, context that we have and everybody has to everybody has to make sure that cheating is is not anymore a common practice. Uh, I think that's what they have to specifically say. I would uh, elaborate on that more but I don't want to take a lot of time. Just quickly on the added value of the European Studies program, uh, as I have mentioned, I wouldn't go into the academic uh, debate but I would rather say whoever contributes to our region has to understand that European Studies program is one of the EU incentives. And that incentive is much more than giving money to the politicians or to the political parties and etc. This is about education, this is about opening our societies, and this is the precondition of Europeanizing, Europeanizing uh, ourselves. So I would rather applaud everybody who is uh, committing uh, to this job, and uh, I would encourage everybody from the Commission as well um, <laughs> to, to, to contribute to this uh, aim. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Nino. <laughs> Again, I would open up the floor for questions, comments, remarks. Maxime? Um, thank you very much uh, for really <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a little concerned that we're, we're, we're talking um, a little bit about um, east of a certain point in Europe is doing everything a certain way and west of a certain point in Europe is doing everything a certain way. I can tell you right now that I battle all the time to get students to do self-study and I battle all the time to stop them just focusing on marks. I also battle all the time to get them to, stop, to start thinking about acquiring knowledge from rather than just employability. Their employability is very, very important. So I think it's, I think it's because I think we're in a little bit of danger saying that we're doing everything right over here yes. and, and yeah. we're doing every, everything not so right over here. And I, I think that, that would be very, very wrong. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maxi. Alexander. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Uh, all three presentations, uh, all three presentations were very interesting. And uh, I was, unfortunately, I didn't hear uh, Mena uh, from the very beginning, but uh, I have caught uh, one of the ideas which uh, uh, got me very interested in it. You talked about the Generation Y, but the Generation Y currently is uh, at, the, um, at the beginning of their professional life. And uh, the new generation, which uh, differs according to Arthur Parkinson, uh, which differs significantly from the generation Y, just is coming, uh, the generation Z is now in the uh, schools. So we have to be ready, we teachers have to be ready to adapt to those, uh, to their uh, manner of studies. And in this sense, uh, actually, what are or what could be the stimuli, the incentives uh, to get students more interested in studies because uh, the uh, career reasons 
uh, is not so strong incentives, not so strong stimulus uh, for the students. Uh, you understand, uh, just uh, unlike Europe, in Ukraine it's quite difficult to find the employment on uh, the, in the fields related to the Euro, to the European studies. So in this case, how could we stimulate uh, students to learn, to, to become uh, lifelong learners? Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> yeah, Maxim. Thank you. I also uh, missed uh, the beginning of the presentation, but I got the, the last part of it. And I have a general question supporting my boss, the head of my department. <laughs> 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 uh, my question relates not only to the generations and uh, these changes, but uh, I got this, if I got this right, and especially about the idea of the European Union institution supporting the exchange and development. Would it not undermine the whole idea of university if our task is to tailor-make students as a focus of professionals in one particular field? Would we then need higher educational institutions so that we produce like highly skilled manual laborers in a particular field? And how would the university as a making? Because I, I, would, I was just a short experience with my, with my uh, two months I took a course on introduction to research at Bratislava in Slovakia. It was the first year bachelor in European studies, 65 students, the majority of whom were highly not motivated to study. They said, like, they said, like, well, we don't know what the labor market is, so we are not that active, so sorry for that. But if they are not active in studies, they do not acquire any skills. On the other hand, if you discuss that you are not studying actively, you are not acquire skills. On the other hand, you don't see your future profession. And my answer was that they said that would undermine the idea of university. You are not here receiving a secondary, you know, uh, technical education, this is university, that's why you have to participate. So wouldn't that be a problem for the whole like, idea of higher education? Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Shall we go in the same order maybe again, Manu? Sure, yeah, I... Um, thanks, I, I really like those two questions actually. And, and to start with the first, um, I think whether it's Generation Y or Z or any other generation. I think the best stimulus to make students learn is not the labor market or career perspectives, at least not for this generation. I think the most important thing is interest them. Make, you know, make them want to learn. And you can only do that by uh, connecting to what they want to do. Um, I mean, the, the best example, of course, is, is the reason why you chose uh, to start uh, studying European studies because you wanted to feel connected to this European idea because it was important to you. And I think that's, that's the most important thing. So, um, yeah, try to see what they want to learn and, and then connect to that. In the end, uh, the, the books that we read or the, the specific knowledge that we, that we learn, um, there is so much that we can learn and we always have to, to make uh, you know, a decision on, okay, we'll focus on this little part, then make that little part count and make it connect as well as possible to what they want to learn. And the second part is educating for the labor market or educating for, let's say, knowledge's sake. I would say, of course, universities aren't uh, sort of higher vocational education, uh, that not at all. Um, but that doesn't mean that in uh, an academic uh, curriculum, you shouldn't have some uh, focus on skills that may be useful on the labor market. I mean, one doesn't have to exclude the other. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's my short answer to that. Very briefly, I will elaborate that mm -hmm. briefly. I mean, I would like to say, yeah, starting from the l second question, I also think that skills are a complement to the knowledge that has to be transmitted. So it certainly is extremely useful for employability <coughs> purposes, but it's not the essence of the teaching. On the other question, I think that, uh, I mean, how to stimulate students to study. I think that what teachers should transmit as a message to students is that whatever their dream is uh, in their life, culture and knowledge is the, the, the key for success in any case. And in order to transmit more concretely this message, I think we should also provide models to show also 
unexpected models. I, I just saw on the TV the other day uh, a service on the uh, Brazilian football player, <laughs> we, since we are in times of World Cup, <laughs> it, which is Socrates. He was an extremely a great uh, football player, but he was a very cultivated person. He was a doctor, he has studied medicines. I think that models like these, and there are lots uh, in the world, could be given to students to make them understand that studying is not just about uh, becoming uh, you know, intellectual or professors, or, but they can follow their, their dreams, their uh, whatever they are. Culture will always, always be a strong instrument for them to develop their, their dreams in the future, I think. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you. I, I would like to... Um pick up two points, first about motivation of students and then to respond um, uh, to the first question. Uh, first I would say how to motivate the student, I would say learn them how to read. And how to read, it doesn't mean to pronounce letters, it means to understand and it means to digest the information, it means to uh, provide your own attitude towards certain issues. And that's how you do that, you do it by bringing uh, Europe closer to the students and that is very easy. For instance, you go, every time you go in the lecture, you ask them, so what happened this weekend in the U? That, that motivates them to go check what happened, what's going on in the EU, because we don't have this context of European uh, news. We don't watch them on the TV, we don't have European voice. Uh, so that's 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 the that's how it should be, uh, creating the the condition, uh, the encouraging discussion on European issues. Uh, well, people I already mentioned. And now, what about the uh, issue on everything is good, great in Europe, everything is bad outside Europe? Uh, that I really didn't want to create this um, uh, this type of um, uh, atmosphere in my speech. Uh, but first, I am a Europeanized Georgian, but first I am Georgian, so I'm trying to give more perspective from, from the bad side because I think first I have to encourage Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia, and then talk about Maastricht University problems because the problems are m much less, and that's what I wanted to say. If we take PBL, of course, in Maastricht also has a problem. And, and the problem is everywhere are the free writers and you meet it everywhere in Europe or out, outside the Europe. But the culture is that good students inform the professors about the laziness of the, of the lazy students and that's common. And in our world, it's not common. You are a very bad, bad person if you do that. So even the good students are not motivated anymore to work in groups. And that's what I'm trying to uh, put forward. I may react real quickly um, on actually both of the points you said. On the second point that you, that you just made, it sounded like you just described my uh, entire <laughs> master's. Uh, so <laughs> it was so frustrating for me to be there with uh, a bunch of 20 students, and yeah. each and every course, three or four students would be the ones saying, oh, but, uh, you know, debating and asking questions. And the rest of them just free riding, hoping that when the year was over, they would have their master's degree. And this was in yeah. Amsterdam. So, um, to, to support your too. point, uh, yeah. indeed. The other one is you said um, what would be really good if, uh, is if the teacher would ask the students what happened in Europe this week. I think you could even uh, turn that around and say what happened in your life this week and why is that relevant to Europe or why is yeah. Europe relevant to, to that. Um, and of course, that may be a bit different in, in Georgia or Ukraine, but especially within the European Union, almost each, uh, every single news item uh, and every single thing that happens in, in a young person's life has some relation to the European Union. And that's what I also tried to say before, try to relate uh, what is happening with the European Union and, and try to show uh, why this is so interesting and why this is so relevant to, to learn. Thank you very much. Looking at the time, unfortunately we have to end our discussion here and as I said, I hope we will continue coming back to these issues also in the next few, uh, few days. Before I hand over to Simon, please give me again a warm applause for our two presenters and our panelists. <laughs>